Hello and welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. Just want to give people a chance to get their audio preferences settled, dialed in. All right, this seems like a pretty good critical mass and I'll make sure that I type this out for people that are joining us a little bit late, but welcome to today's user group. Uh, just going to cover a few technical details quickly for those that have not joined us for an edge user group meeting in the past. Uh, we use Zoom webinar for this platform. It's very similar as you can probably tell to Zoom meeting, but with a few key differences. Uh, the first and biggest is that your cameras and microphones are disabled by default, so you don't have to worry about interrupting us or being overheard or anything like that, but it does mean that your options for interaction are limited to text based ones. So first you have your chat, which is very familiar. Uh, the difference there is that you can choose to send messages only to the hosts and panels or to everyone, and you have to explicitly select that when you send a message. Um, and then the other is Q&A. If you click on that, you can uh, choose to answer any question you have for the panel. Uh, you can ask those questions anonymously and others can view those questions and can add their own comment or even like them if they want to. Um, so those are the main ways, but if you have any trouble or any technical difficulty, feel free to just type it out and I'll, I'll come and help you out. Uh, so without further ado, I wanna hand it off to our uh, host for the day, Christina Cart. Christina? Hey, thank you, Mike, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Usually Jasmine is the one doing the intro, but today I get to. Um, for those of you guys who haven't met before, my name is Christina, and I am ACRO's International Support Specialist, working closely with my colleagues, Drew and Julia and Dave, as well as with our IESC team to continuously update EDGE. Um, joining us today are my colleagues, Julia and Drew, as well as Dave, and um, also, Emily and Robert Watkins from our IESC voting team. For our newcomers to the EDGE user group, I'd like to give just a brief introduction to our IESC team and who they are as well as what they do. Um, the individuals serving on the IES, uh, IESC excuse me, team are all volunteers who are experienced professionals with incredible knowledge of our world education systems, foreign credential evaluations, as well as international admissions. Um, the members of our IESC team have worked in higher education as well as with private evaluation companies. Um, they've each authored uh, country profiles and have been instrumental to our research projects culminated in publications sponsored by ACRO as well as NAFSPA. Uh, so you can be confident that the recommendations presented within EDGE as well as all edits and updates made have been properly researched by our IESC experts, vetted, discussed, and all together represent the very viewpoints um, that we vote on in the IESC. They also have two fellows each year and they are brilliant colleagues that join the great IESC team on a research project relevant to EDGE and our updates. Our current two fellows are Haley and Rebecca. They're pictured in the slide um, previous, but they're partnering on a project for the Bologna compliant degrees in the European Union. And so we're looking forward to the results of those projects. Um, and Julia, if you'd help me pull up our poll before we jump into our agenda. That'd be awesome. I sure will. That's Mike. Okay, we have, a, as we always do when we start this webinar, we have a few poll questions for you. And so I'm going to read those aloud and we'll give you time to answer. And the first question is, are you an EDGE subscriber? That's a simple yes, no answer. Second question is, is this your first user group? Yes or no? I hope we have lots of returnees and a few new folks. And number three, what segment do you represent? Are you an institution, an evaluation service, government, or a law firm? Please take some time right now. Mike will leave the poll up for just, what, 20 seconds or so? <clears throat> Play the Jeopardy music in the background. That's something we need to do, Mike. We need to have Jeopardy music going on. I had forgotten about that, but you can also <laughs> do the agenda if you want to while we wrap it up. Let's go ahead and do that. So to, there's our agenda for today. And you'll see that you have to have your passports ready because we're going to travel from St. Vincent and the Grenadines to Lebanon, Uganda, Burundi, and India. 
We're also going to update you on a few uh, nice features of EDGE that we'd really like you to utilize. And we'll tell you about some uh, highlights of upcoming events that are on the way. And finally, as somebody just mentioned, we have QR codes. And then we'll follow that by a Q&A. So get ready, everyone. Here are our answers. Woo! Yay, 99% of you are 68 out of 69 our EDGE subscribers. So to that one person who is not, let this be a good endorsement to you of the usefulness of EDGE and we hope you join us and do decide to subscribe. Is this your first user group? Ah, only about 28% of you are our first timers. The rest of you have been around here before and so you know sort of how this runs. Um, and finally, what segment of the staff do you represent? We have primarily institutional staff, 83%. That's wonderful. So glad to have you here, our members here. We also have some evaluation service staff and some governments. No law firms, so hey, we can be free and easy here. So let's go on. We've talked about the agenda a little bit. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our great colleague, Robert Watkins from the University of Texas at Austin to lead us into St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Robert? Thank you, Julia. Uh, Good to be here once again. Um, I've got a couple of things for you. This first one, as Julia noted, is St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It was a change to the post-secondary grading scale. Um, the, what we discovered, and this was from an EDGE user that brought it to our attention, uh, and I think I've said this before, but I see that there are, as Julia pointed out, a number of new folks here. So I'll just sort of kind of go through that same pattern again. And that is that when we rolled EDGE out, um, in the middle of the first decade of the century, um, there was some real pressure to get this done uh, to include all countries. Um, we thought we could get away with just the top sending countries according to the, uh, um, uh, to the immigration service, but no, uh, ACRO leadership wanted us to include every country. And so we quickly pulled everything together, got them uh, uh, compiled and then entered and up there and rolled out. Um, the problem is when you move that rapidly under such pressure, um, mistakes can be made. And one of the mistakes that was made, it was the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, not a place visited by evaluators uh, terribly often. So that was part of the problem, I suspect. Uh, we just hadn't had a chance to go back and look at it on any consistent basis. But somebody finally did, drew our attention to it, and what it was, was, was that we had failed to include on a hundred point scale that, that if, you, if you're looking at it, or if you're familiar with it, you know, the, the, they use a hundred point scale um, and we left the band out. We left out 65 to 69% on that scale in original rollout. And so we quickly needed to fix that. And that's indeed what we did after our last meeting. Um, and so we now have that band, 65 to 69 percent in there, and not just the numerical percentage, but also the indigenous grade points that they assign to that grade range, as well as their own indigenous letter grade. And then, of course, we had to come up with um, our own uh, suggested U.S. equivalent grade for you all to, who are users to, to use. And so uh, you now have that in um, edge. If you were to go to St. Grenadines, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines now uh, on the edge on, while, you're, while you're listening, then you'll see that we have that in there. Basically, and I'll conclude with this, they basically have a 100 point scale that's very, very similar to ours. There are some differences. For example, um, they have an A range of 80 to 100 in the United States, ours is 90 to 100. But what we decided was that we would essentially suggest U.S. grade equivalences that more or less mirror what they are doing in terms of their letter grades. And it's important that you see the percentages that go with it um, as you look at that scale. So we made that adjustment and we encourage those of you out there that use EDGE, um, when you come across things like this, something's missing, um, uh, please let us know and we'll add it to the agenda as quickly as possible and get to it and see if we will research it, of course, but see if we can't make that adjustment or at least come back to you and say, you know, why we're not going to change something in there. 
Uh, with that, Michael, let's move on to the next one. Well, uh, is, Robert, oh. right before we go over to Lebanon, I was going to mention that when people do reach out with that information about some edit that needs to be made, why did you decide to reach out to us? There's some information that that led you to a conclusion that there was that change that needed to be present. Um, so send us that information. Um, send us those redacted copies of documents. Um, send us those links to the ministry where you where you went through and you found where there was a new law that came out. That's the information that uh, the IESC really needs in order to make these determinations. And remember, as Christina mentioned, this is an all volunteer group. So everything that you can do for that front end research allows them to uh, apply their expertise and get that response back to you quicker. Thank you for all your participation. Robert, sorry for Drew, interrupting. That's all right, Drew, and thanks so much for saying it because uh, a very uh, specific instance of, of something like that was last user group meeting in which uh, we talked about the grading scale in Djibouti where it was drawn to our attention again from an edge user who also sent us some government um, information, uh, uh, links uh, to, to government sites that showed that there had been a change in the structure of uh, primary education in Djibouti. And so that's exactly what, what Drew is referencing here. And that is, you know, tell us what you found that, that's odd or incorrect or missing, but also supply the context within which you stumbled across it. Because undoubtedly what's gonna happen is, is you're gonna look at it and you're gonna say, that doesn't seem right. It's not according to the document that I'm analyzing here. And then you'll go on the on the web. You'll find the answer from the government or from uh, legislation from the government or something along those lines. And you'll send that and say, "You missed this, and here's why." <laughs> so that will help us tremendously. All right, let's take a look then at uh, the, uh, Lebanon. This was really uh, something that was a, a real simple uh, addition that resulted from. Um, I think it was a document here at UT Austin that one of my evaluators came across, or I stumbled across it somehow. <laughs> and, um, and so I thought it odd that the university uh, transcript I was looking at had a four year MD degree in Lebanon, when I vaguely recalled that that, that, didn't, that seemed short. So I went into EDGE and sure enough, we say that it's seven years. We have one entry and that is, that it says that it's a seven year degree from high school. And that's true enough. But as it turns out, the um, English language institutions of which there are at least three that I immediately come to my mind, AUB, um, LAU, Lebanese American University, and also Belamond, and that was the one that I was looking at, uh, University of Belamond, um, they had a four year degree after a first degree a first bachelor's degree, so that um, it wasn't seven years after, high, or it was another pathway to get to the same degree, depending on what your interior qualification was. It turns out that these English language programs that pattern their, their medical degrees very much after the American model, um, you approach it the same way that we do in the States, which is to say, uh, you get a first degree, and then you apply to a med school that's four years and you get the, the MD at the, at, the, at the other end and you go through rotations and so forth, clin uh, clerkships and so on. Um, so this was a simple fix in that all we needed to do was add to an author note to the existing credential entry for the seven year medical degree. And that was simply to say the doctor of medicine MD program taught in English is awarded after four years of medical study following the pro. Uh, the Francophone uh, institutions in Lebanon seem to all have hung on to the, the standard model, which was seven years after baccalaureate, uh, Lebanese bach. And so uh, it was, a, as I say, a simple fix to just add this in there. And with that, I am now going to turn it over to Emily Tsei, who's going to talk about two or three things for you. Thanks, Robert. All righty, so uh, on to Uganda. Uh, we had uh, an edge user who brought to our attention some um, unfortunate um, 
language uh, that was in the uh, profile. Um, what happened was uh, is that it stated that the certificate of education is um, uh, represents completion of lower secondary education and gives access to upper secondary education. And uh, I apologize for my, my pauses here. The slide is a little bit different from the one that I was working on previously. Uh, but again, uh, the, the language had that it represents completion of lower secondary education leading to upper secondary. Yet at the same time, we had a placement recommendation that it was uh, completion of senior high school. So that doesn't quite jive, uh, logically speaking, and this is where an issue of labeling uh, occurs. Uh, the um, Ugandan uh, education system is very similar to that of the UK um, in terms of an 11 plus 2 system. So you have 11 years of primary and secondary education. Um, and then in the UK, you get the GCSE or the General Certificate of Secondary Education, or in Uganda, you get the Certificate of Education. So that marks the completion of the secondary education cycle. They can move on to employment and further study. However, um, there is an additional two years if they want to go on to university specifically. And then those two years culminate in A-levels. So there's the UK A-levels, and then Uganda has its own A-levels uh, as, as well. And those we really regard um, as comparable to, for example, AP or Advanced Placement Credit. It's really the Ugandan Certificate of Education and the UK GCSE respectively that marks the completion of secondary education. And for that reason, we regard as equivalent to um, completion of senior high school. So that's Uganda and we uh, cleaned up that, the language there. Uh, on to our next region. Oh, here we go. Um, so th th this is uh, here we have a, a s sample of the actual document, the Uganda Certificate of Education. And uh, as I mentioned, it's an 11 plus 2 structure. And this uh, does represent completion of, of high school. On to the next one. OK, Burundi. So um, last month, uh, we talked about uh, the overall change uh, and educational reforms in terms of it going from a 13-year system to a 12-year system. And then we focused on the changes in the credentials at the end of upper secondary education. Uh, but of course, with these educational reforms, it's just not happening there. There are also impacts to the primary and lower secondary education system. So uh, we're following up and addressing those updates uh, now here as well. And that's what we're calling Burundi part two. Uh, on to the next slide. So um, Burundi actually has, as with any country, it's an evolving system. So there's been a series of changes. Uh, and um, so these two ladders here on the left and right should really be regarded as snapshots or moments in, in time. Uh, so the 13-year system previously was a 6 plus 4 plus 3 structure. So we had uh, six years of primary uh, leading to the certificate of the end of primary study four years of lower secondary, which led to the common track certificate, and then three years of upper secondary, which led to the Diploma of General Humanities. So in their change to the 12-year system, what they also did was they merged primary and lower secondary education into one educational cycle known as uh, the Fundamental Studies cycle. So they merged that into one stage, and uh, what would have been then 10 years uh, was reduced by one year to nine years. Um, so that leads to the certificate of the end of fundamental studies, and that's been added to EDGE now, uh, which uh, it had not been uh, when we discussed this, these changes uh, in last month's uh, user group webinar. So following uh, the nine-year cycle of the fundamental studies, then um, students can go on to upper secondary, but that's been renamed and structured, restructured as post-fundamental studies. Uh, so then that's another three years, and at the end, they earn the certificate of the end of general post-fundamental studies. Um, the important thing here is that uh, 
at regardless of the 13 or the 12 year system at the very end sorry something's been chopped off <laughs> the slide as well but regardless if it's a 12 or 13 year system at the very end if the students want to uh, move on to university they have to take the state examinations which would then lead upon successful completion would lead to the diploma de top or the state diploma. So at the very end, even though it's a, uh, whether it's a 13 or 12 year system, um, the credential you're looking for still um, would be the diploma de tot or the state diploma. Okay, so um, that's Burundi. And then let's go on to the next slide. Uh, now we're gonna uh, land further east in India. Uh, where we also had um, an edge user inquire about the uh, associate membership in the Institute of Company Secretaries of India, or the ICSI. So um, this is actually very similar in setup and structure to the ICAI, which is the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. So what happens um, in the case of ICAI, um, there is no in India, no university degree in accounting. So to train to become an accountant, a uh, chartered accountant, um, they have to go through this system where they would study, take a series of examinations, three stages, gain work experience, and then become um, associate member. And so this is very similar with um, ICSI to become a company secretary. Uh, they also have to study, move through three stages of examinations and gain work experience. Uh, that's the only way they can gain um, company secretary uh, expertise. And uh, it's not a secretary in the way we would think of a secretary. Uh, company secretaries in India actually specialize in corporate governance and compliance. So what we have up here um, on the right is a mark sheet from the uh, professional program examination, which is the third and final stage. The three stages for ICSI are foundation, executive, and professional. Uh, previously, they were foundation, intermediate, and final. So here, when you look at the paper titles, uh, they include company secretarial practice, drafting, appearances, and pleadings, financial, treasury, and forex ma management, corporate restructuring and insolvency, uh, strategic management, alliances, and international trade, advanced tax laws and practice, due diligence and corporate compliance management, and finally, governance, business ethics, and sustainability. So um, as you can see, these are uh, hardcore subjects in corporate co uh, governance and compliance, and these are areas which one would not be able to pursue through a university degree such as the BCom. Uh, they would have to go through the ICSI. Uh, on to the next slide, please. So uh, as with the ICAI, the, the Chartered Accounts, and the ICSI, um, these bodies are recognized by the UGC or the University Grants Commission. So for this reason, we are um, giving it an academic equivalency or placement recommendation. Um, completion of high school, standard 12, is required for entry into this program. Um, but in many instances, uh, bachelor degree holders uh, enter the program. And uh, if their degree is in any field but fine arts, they are actually able to uh, gain exemptions from the foundation uh, stage or, or stage one. So in EDGE, you will find this entry now, uh, thanks to our EDGE user, and uh, we will see a placement recommendation of a U.S. bachelor degree. And that's it for the ICSI. All right, and for thank you guys for some Acro Edge user updates. Um, similar to all of the updates we've been making with our content, we're also trying to make user experience updates, including how you guys contact us and how we are able to reach back out. Um, it says on the slide that we're working with our web design partners to add an attachment area, but actually we've already finished that. So I'll have to update that slide as well. But for the submit and update, when you are um, using that, button please make sure that you are submitting redacted documents that again as robert and drew mentioned helps our team um, sift through um, our questions that we receive from you guys and uh, use our expertise to quickly make a turnover in edge um, submit an update really is for those specific update requests or questions pertinent to the pages that you're looking on um, and any relevant research again for context is much appreciated whereas the contact uh, edge 
uh, excuse me, the contact us edge form is for um, subscription interests or login issues that you might encounter, or if you're looking to change your edge manager or requesting for an invoice to be resent. There are similar questions that can be uh, sent to our email as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and again, when you are submitting credentials for the IESC, um, please, please, please make sure that you're sending those sample documents. They just make things so much easier for us to reference. Um, please submit the front and the back and make sure to redact to protect your students' um, information. So making sure that that name, date of birth, as well as any identification number or record number that might uh, make the transcript traceable, <clears throat> excuse me. Other information um, to provide includes links or um, the website names that you're looking at, ministries, um, upcoming file attachment options, and our edge forms uh, include, oh, I'm sorry, upcoming file attachment options in our edge form. Um, make sure that they're issued by um, recognized institutions, make sure that uh, the minimum entrance criteria is met for that program. Um, discuss the duration and description of that full-time program and whether it provides access to further education or if it's terminal. And you can, again, always email us at edge at acro.org. Next slide, please. And I'm going to pass it off to Julia again. Thanks, Christina. So we'd like to invite you all to our 107th in ACRO annual meeting, which is scheduled for April 3rd to the 6th in beautiful Portland, Oregon. Uh, the ACRO meeting is an opportunity to learn, to engage, to network, and advance alongside higher ed professionals. You'll join your colleagues and many of us that are here on this webinar there. Uh, we really hope to, to welcome you there and we're very excited to get back to an in-person conference. I was at a conference recently uh, for one of our regional conferences and it was just it was wonderful people were so excited to be there in person and networking with one another we'll have over 100 sessions at the conference um, everything from admissions to international credential evaluation to records and transfer so please join us uh, there will be a pre-conference workshop I am doing that with my colleague, Leslie Clausen Eicher, who many of you know. This will be a two day intensive workshop, which care, covers the best industry practices of foreign credential evaluation. And the course is particularly gonna force focus on China and India. So always a big hit. That pre-conference workshop will take place April 2nd and 3rd. It will be done in plenty of time to uh, join the opening plenary and the uh, reception afterwards. So we hope you can join us there. The early registration uh, needs to be done by February 28th, and hotel registration closes on March 10th. So think about that. There's a QR code where you can access the rest of the information that uh, pertains to the annual meeting. We can go to the next slide. Also, I'd like to talk about our International Institute. Um, that's actually going on right now as we speak. Uh, much of what we cover, and so you can't join that one now, but if certainly if you join the uh, uh, annual meetings pre-conference workshop, you'll get a lot of that same content and that same training um, from there. So if you, can't, if you didn't make the International Institute, think about that pre-conference workshop. We're also working on the dates for the Summer International Institute, which we uh, think will be sometime in mid to late July. It's, it, th these are just great opportunities to get some real good hands-on training and networking and really a collaborative environment. Uh, Robert is a uh, perennial faculty member. Uh, I step in for faculty there as well. So it's just a great opportunity and we'd love to meet you there. And it's, it's much smaller and, and just a really good opportunity with us. Next slide. So for those of you who are interested, uh, we have a, the Gloria R. Nathanson Research Fund for International Education. This is an opportunity if you're doing some research or would like to undertake some research, either in your work or, or your academic studies, if you're going for a master's in comparative ed, this is a great opportunity to do that research and receive some funding for it. Um, up to $1,000 can be uh, awarded for travel expenses, research materials, or other costs that are related to your research. 
These could include something like a full country study. Uh, maybe there's something you think we need to update in a country we need to, to look at and you wanna take that uh, avenue. It could be uh, just the updates on a country that's already in there or a white paper of any particular interest or topic that you might have. Uh, we can go on the next slide. Christina, would you like to talk about the on-demand learning series? Sure, absolutely. Um, so we do offer an international series that is available to you at any point in time, which is really convenient. So in the event that you can't make one of uh, the sessions that Julia just talked about, a lot of the things that we have to offer are also available at your fingertips again at any time. Um, the international series offers a variety of courses designed to support your admissions officers, um, and also any international credential professionals. Um, all the series are really supposed to be designed uh, as hands-on. So they have exercises where you're actually going through uh, transcripts and practicing what you'd be doing on an everyday basis with our assistants and with, um, with the step-by-step -step guides. Um, you can also earn acro badges, which are really great and um, any, excuse me, any acro on-demand learning completion looks really great on a resume and just in general is a really great asset to have um, for you and your team. Uh, when you do download um, the international series or one of the different, excuse me, one of the different topics covered, it's available not only to you, but to your entire office. So again, this is just a really great way for you guys to be on the same page and to be learning together. And again, at the convenience of your own schedule. Um, some of the topics we cover, uh, cover the countries where you see transcripts usually coming in from the most, uh, such as China, Egypt, Francophone Africa is another big sending country, India as well, the Soviet system and beyond is covered, the UK, uh, Europe and the Bologna system, as well as um, other specific countries we offer. And so go ahead and check out that QR code at your convenience so you can uh, take a look at those, at those courses. Next slide, please. And now we are at the point where we make time to answer your questions. I can see that there are actually two already here. So let me mosey on over to those. To those. Um, and if you guys have questions, again, now is the perfect time to ask them. Please use that Q&A feature. But we're gonna start with Margo. Margo, thanks for your question. Uh, she asks, if we submit something via the contact, contact form, will we automatically receive an email acknowledging our submission? I thought I submitted a question with redacted documents, but I can't any find any evidence that I actually did. Ah, okay. So that's actually a great question. Thank you for asking that. That's something that we're working on right now and updating how we communicate because um, it is really important that you know that we received your question, but we do we do receive all of the questions and they are um, in a huge file right now that we're working to get back to. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience. Um, and we will work on that confirmation email. Colin, I'm gonna to get to your question next. Does ACRO have any best practice resources for evaluating um, aperture exams? Julia, can you hop in on that one? And just before we get onto the the avatar, um, I'm guessing that Robert's also going to have some thoughts on on that one. Um, just just going back uh, to uh, those of you that do submit those documents that are redacted, you're going to see that response from the IESC sooner when they come in like that. Um, that allows uh, everything that has a that to just like any application that comes in, if it's complete it kind of moves over into a different stack that they're able to address a lot quicker. So um, though there is not at this moment um, recognition of your question that comes to you, um, that, is, that is very helpful feedback and we will think about the best way to communicate that to everyone, um, but know that we're gonna be able to get back to you faster when you submit that completed packet. So without further ado, Abitur away. <laughs> well, Abitur away. And Abitur is something that we see in Germany for those of you who may not have encountered it. And yes, Robert is chomping at the bit to speak. I, I'd love to have uh, anybody else chime in, Dave or Emily as well. So Robert, I'll let you go ahead. Thanks, Julia. Um, <clears throat> yes, this, this is fun because, well, first of all, um, I'm infinitely older than Julia. So therefore, I've seen the German system kind of change and transform over time. Um, of course, there was Bologna, but, but in addition to Bologna, which is at the higher education level, there were changes done uh, at the uh, secondary level that um, created issues for us. 
when I first began, uh, we were looking at essentially a 13 year system uh, for the classical university bound student. You know, there, as you know about Germany, there are several other pathways you can go, but for the university bound student headed towards taking the Abitur Prüfung and getting afterward, after passing it, getting the Zeugnis der Allgemeinen Hochschulreife, which is the certificate that enables admission to any, uh, uh, any higher education institution, um, they would go generally 13 years. There would be a 13th class or, or grade. And the system was known as G9. And the reason they called it G9, G stands for gymnasium. The reason they called it G9 was that um, the, the traditional or the, the classical path, and it wasn't the only pathway by any means, because I know a lot of you done German documents know about Hauptschule, Realschule and some others, but a classical pathway was four years of Grundschule, uh, so first through fourth grades, then gymnasium, that lasted for nine years, a grand total of 13 years of uh, primary secondary education that culminated in the Abitur Pufung and the Zeugnis that followed. Um, because it was 13 years and because, and if you've, any of you have heard me do presentations, this sound, should sound familiar to you, US admissions officers do not like to give credit for study done in high school, however, when that high school experience uh, altogether transcends the American 12-year model, we pause and we start to think about awarding possible advanced credit. And so we did give credit um, for those 13-year uh, those abitures up until the 1990s when the German states, and remember education in Germany is controlled by the states, known as Land or Lender in plural. And the states then controlled it. Now, the interesting thing was is after unification and the uh, former DDR, uh, the German, East German government, the East German portion um, joined, rejoined the rest of Germany and it became one, you had a, a dichotomy. You had the Eastern folks that had generally 12 year systems, not all, but most of them, uh, and then you had all the West that had 13 year systems. So um, what the Germans decided to do was to make everybody equal. So there was none of this, this us and them kind of thing after unification. And so um, the Western uh, states lender would start to drop down to a G8 gymnasium, eight, eight years after four year Grundschule. 12 years altogether, they still, and this was the important thing, they still kept the same content in that led to the Abitur and the, the resulting Zeugnis, the Orgelmann and Hochschulreife, they kept the same amount of content. So experts on Germany said, okay, nothing has changed in a curricular sense. It's just that it's now 12 years. But purists like Robert, decided that we weren't going to give credit anymore because now we're looking at a 12-year system and I don't give credit for 12-year systems in France, in Germany, or anywhere else. So that was that. Um, what we've now found is, is that parents and students are pushing back at the state governments and they're saying, wait a minute, now you're making us do the same amount of work with one, yes, one less year to do it in. And we don't like that. It's putting too much stress on our children. No, we're not going to do this. Go back to the old way. And so slowly but surely, you're going to start to see transitions back to G9. And that is uh, Bavaria started it off in 2017. And others will follow. Some actually never left. I found some, some schools in uh, Hesse that, that, never, that never abandoned uh, G9. But most of them did. Baden-Württemberg is a big state with a lot of, uh, with a large population, and a lot of schools. They, they went to a 12-year system and so on. Also, you may have heard the term turbo abitur. That's another term that's sometimes used in place of G8, meaning that it, we get to the, the, what it simply means is, is we get to the abitur faster than we used to. 
But now we're beginning to see this transition back. So the question arises, will we now give credit again for a 13 year IB tour? And the answer is, as far as I'm concerned, yes, I will. At UT Austin, we're gonna give credit. Uh, I consult with um, Foreign Credential Service of America. Uh, and so I would probably try to lean on them to, to give credit for a 13 year IB tour as well. Um, some say we should have been given it even for the 12 because nothing changed. But again, I told you I'm a purist. Um, finally, uh, we just need to wait and see how this goes because here's the other piece. And with this, I'll conclude. And that is Germany under the Bologna compliant degree structure that they introduced in 2003, 2004, um, along with a lot of the other original signatory countries to Bologna, they chose a three-year first degree, first cycle model. And so we've been saying that 180 ECTS, 90 semester hours, three-year full-time degree is not comparable to a U.S. four-year, 120 semester degree. So if they are buttressed by a 13th year, as indeed the Italians are, and as indeed the the British are with their A-levels, then we may have a different situation with respect to, um, to a German three-year degree if they return to uh, G9. With that, I'm going to go back to Drew or whoever. No, it's Christina that's that's watching over questions. Actually, I do want to chime in, if possible, about the Abu Tour uh -oh. as well, and and just so offer well. some <laughs> just offer some counterpoints uh, for consideration. Um, yeah, I, I, I do completely agree with and appreciate uh, the stance that, you know, we don't want to go overboard with uh, granting advanced credit for secondary school credentials, particularly if they represent 12 year systems. Um, this one is unique in that um, whether it's the 12 year or the 13 year abitur, uh, the content is the same. Um, they're just studying it in a shorter or longer period of time. Uh, they have the same, all, all the students, the holders of the abitur, regardless of which state or land they're from, they have the same status. And with that, the same access to university study. So if they're applying to universities across different states, parts of the country, it's not as though they give preference um, to a 13 year abitur holder, you know, or, or state, particular state versus a 12 year abitur holder. They're regarded as, as the same in that way. Um, I also hate to bring up this point because I don't want it to be used against me when we're discussing other uh, high school credentials, um, but uh, we do uh, recognize or give credit, uh, AP credit, and that's based on a 12-year system um, in the U.S. The difference is that it's an entirely separate um, examination system uh, from the high school credential. But those are just some counter uh, arguments to consider when you are looking at the uh, German Abitur. Oh, oh and I'm was... sorry. Oh. Yes, so just quickly, sorry. Um, I also want to give a plug because I think there was a question about resources in general. Um, this uh, book was published, uh, Karen Lucas's book was actually published by IRF, um, where I uh, work. And um, it was published in 2002, so it was a decade ago, but it's still a phenomenal book. You can see how the pr pages are frayed, it's falling apart. Um, I. I am not biased in saying how excellent a resource it is, and it actually can be accessed through um, the IER vault if you sign up. It's free, and then um, it is, it's been scanned, so it's now available as an e-publication if you're dealing with German credentials. So that's just something to have on your radar. Um, in the chat, I will put um, the uh, website address. Again, if you sign up for the IER vault, it's free, and you have access to resources, including Karen Lucas's book, which again, um, which I really believe is fantastic. Emily, so you're absolutely correct. And so I want to just put another plug in for that book and encourage people to get it, because even though it was written around 2000, 2001, 2002, it's still an extremely good resource. Karen's just phenomenal. And um, one of the reasons that you could say that I'm wrong about not giving credit for the 12 year um, G8 Abitur is because Karen Lucas, who also subscribed to the same year counting model uh, that, that we embrace at, at, at the IESC, um, she believed that credit should still be given even when it went to 12 years. Because I specifically, it's not in her book, but I specifically asked her uh, about that. And she wrote me an email saying that she would encourage, she would endorse 
giving credit for that 12 year situation. So Emily, you're absolutely correct. One thing, however, before I let somebody else jump in, um, you know, we never really, really answered, is it Krista Cole's question? Um, and she said, how do you do it? So let's say we're gonna give credit, okay? Doesn't matter if it's 12 or 13 or what, all right? So how would we go about it? What I used to see when we were giving credit, there were two models or two approaches. Uh, one was when you when you got the actual Zeugnis to Algemeine and Hochschule Reife, it didn't matter what state, they all made them pretty much the same. They were multi-paged. And um, when you opened it up, you had on the far right, you had the Abitur results, the Abitur briefing exam results. But on the left-hand side, you had the grades of the final two years. It could be 11 and 12, or it could be 12 and 13. And so some would go down the, the list of those, those courses and give credit, little bits of credit uh, for each of those courses, totaling 30 hours altogether. Um, I was always of the opinion that the second model was the better one because it's easy. And I like easy and quick because at UT Austin, we have a high volume. And that is, although not of German <laughs> applicants necessarily, and certainly not of admitted ones, but um, that is to go straight to the exam, uh, the exam results. Um, uh, and, and then the, the Prüfungsfach is what they're called, the exam courses. And there's generally about four of them, and German's usually always one of them, and English is often another. And then I would simply divide up evenly, since they're not weighted really, I would divide up evenly the amount of credit I want to give among those four courses. So if I have four courses and I want to give eight, give eight hours each, that's 32 hours, and that's a perfect number for our one year of credit. So that's the approach that I would take, giving credit for the exam subjects that occur at the end of the 13th year or 12th, if you will. And with that, I'll send it back. Hey, Robert, Emily, this is great. These are the discussions that uh, I really enjoy that the IESC has going back and forth, all these different things to consider. And you've both highlighted the importance of establishing um, your practices for whatever your institution, your company. I know we don't have any law firms with us today, but when you're going through, there has to be a rationale that you need to apply consistently so that every applicant is going to be brought in and have that equal opportunity. Um, are you looking to develop your international policies? Consider what you do in a domestic situation. Are you going to give credit to uh, a domestic student that presents the same scenario? Well, Make sure that international students getting that same uh, weight applied to what they bring to you. And so as long as there's a rationale, as long as you can explain that this is how your office is doing it, you've done the research. You know what you're trying, you, you, you are the most qualified person to make this decision because you've gone and you've looked at that research yourself. So be confident in your decision and back it up with consistency. Such great points, Drew, and, and exactly so. And, and actually, you'll, you'll know that this is also why we limit our IESC meetings to one hour, <laughs> because these, these discussions can go deep and long, um, but always very thoughtful discussions. Uh, I would like to add one more thing to Colin's question, and that is that uh, ACRO, along with NASA, partners uh, with the Baden-Württemberg uh, Ministry to provide the Baden-Württemberg seminar um, every year. And hopefully next year it will be on location again. And it's a great chance to, to learn about the German education system and to get some real insights into institutions and types of institutions in the state of Baden-Württemberg. So look for that on our website as well as something to sign up for. Christine, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure, and thank you guys for all your input. I am looking at the time and I wanna make sure we get to Aaron and Rachel and these questions as well. Um, Aaron, your question, just so for recording sake, um, I'm gonna read it out loud and we'll have our, um, our team answer. Can you please go over Australian high school state examination results certificates, specifically Queensland and New South Wales. Queensland students have been submitting a senior statement of results, but there is not um, a results sheet of the Queensland Certificate of Education, which she, which sheet shows the final Queensland's exam results. Um, for the new South Wales H, 
SC, do you recommend only stage six HSC course results to be considered for GPA calculations or would you be, or would best practice, excuse me, be to include stage six prelim courses and stage five courses? Let the team that one. Oh, I'm unmuted. Sorry, I couldn't tell if I was muted or not. Um, I, I guess I would have thought that there would be, in addition to the QCE, of course, there would be um, a record of achievement for the Queensland results, at least for the last two years, the, the, the 11th and 12th, that followed the year 10 certificate. Um, so I'm surprised if you're not getting that, but I would certainly ask for a certificate that shows the actual course results. One of the things that uh, the NCAA has, has done over the last few years is to go from looking simply at a final year ending exam where a lot of countries in the world have a national exam, national in, uh, leaving exam for upper secondary. They've moved away from that model and more towards the US model of counting units. And so the NCAA nowadays uh, requires that um, for Division One, Division Two athletes, that you um, produce the the year for year results, and that would mean going way back to get the nine and tens, leading to the year ten exam, and then finally to eleven and twelve individually beyond simply the QCE, and um, and then get the, those results as well, so that you can count units, sixteen academic units with a certain GPA and then match that to the SAT, ACT results. That's the way it's traditionally been done and still is done through the, the NCAA Clearinghouse. So I, I'd be surprised if they can't produce for you from the school um, a standard document that's a record of achievement, I think was used to be the name they called it. Uh, if they've changed it, then there's gonna be a new name and just ask for that as well. Thank you. And does anybody else want to chime in or we can move to the next question? All right, we're going to go on to Rachel. Thank you, um, Robert. Next question. I've recently had a couple of students apply to my school who are in the British system, but have not taken any exams yet. They expect to have the IGCSE results in August of this year. And while my school does accept this level of study as equivalent to the US diploma, high school diploma, excuse me, we've never had students apply before uh, the exam results are available. Since internal grades don't count in the British system, I'd love to hear your recommendations for this situation. Have you ever admitted a high school student before they finished high school? Everyone applies that senior year. Think about what you would do in the case of that domestic student and how you can apply something that is uh, equivalent, comparable uh, to that international student. Just something to put out there. Um, anyone have any specific recommendations though? Well, I, I've been starting to look at this um, and I tell you someone who, who, who has actually been looking at it and Drew, you're, you're the one, the lead on this. And that's our friend, Jonathan um, uh, Nguyen who has been uh, working on a chart for, of countries and what they did during the pandemic that were traditionally exam-based systems that were unable to hold those exams for whatever reason. A little bit that I know, um, and in the NCAA, by the way, um, embraced this and determined that they were gonna have to change um, freshman eligibility. In fact, they, they quit actually extending um, uh, actual official eligibility statements and said that they were eligible or, or that they were qualifiers, they quit issuing qualifier statements. And they said, instead, you're just eligible to participate in division one, division two sports. <laughs> and so they sort of finessed the problem. Um, but basically, as I understand it, the British had, of course, everybody had 2019 exams um, in the summer of 2019, but there were none in the summer of 2020. And what they told the, the, British, the British schools anyway, and I'm sure it was played out across the world in Anglophone, systems was that they would ask the teachers to use either mock exams or based on the things that our questioner you know, pointed out are not generally important and that's internal marks to try to compri compile 
some sort of equivalency that year to enable students to progress. Some students chose to wait another year to 2021 to uh, take those exams. And my understanding is, is that there were 2021 exams, um, uh, GCSEs, IGCSEs in some locales, by no means all, the usual places, but that there were some. And as, as our questioner pointed out, August, uh, for summer 2022, they're, they're on tap to, to go ahead and do it as normal, but although we'll have to wait and see if that really happens. Um, but, but it seems, and maybe to conclude and perhaps lead to an answer, um, it seems like we may have to do something that we're told in an exam-based system we shouldn't have to do or shouldn't need to do or shouldn't do at all. And that is to uh, go with internal assessments and marks in lieu of the exams that are not taking place. Thank you, Robert. And I think that's also a really important question just because um, as we've seen with Jonathan's work, a lot of countries are experiencing that delay in light of the pandemic, in light of countries that are, are in crisis. So um, thank you for your input there. Nia, I'm gonna circle back to your question at the very end because our last slides actually cover this. Um, so I, I didn't forget at all, but I do wanna make sure that we cover also the, the anonymous question that came in and it's um, regarding Iran. They say, we have been having some issues with um, gaining documents from Iran. Um, from that particular group of students due to political process of issuing transcripts, especially higher level degree documents. What is the process for students gaining official transcripts and degrees? And what is the timing of these documents being released to the students? I'm sure Emily's got a good answer here too, but uh, let me begin because we just see a lot of CUT Austin. And that is, um, we've actually seen it, it was before pandemic. It was, it's been for the last several years. Iranian students, okay, if you go to a public school in Iran, a post-secondary institution, sorry, university, uh, you get to, you're allowed to attend on free tuition. And if that sounded like it was in quotation marks, it was. That's not really free because when they're done, even though they're not paying anything, when they're done and finished all their courses and ready to get their degrees, the, the government will say, okay, and through the universities, okay, you now owe us money, four years of tuition that you got for free. And here's what we want you to do. We want you to get a job. We want you to work. It doesn't have to be for the government. It doesn't have to be for the military. It can be for um, uh, the corporate sector, uh, whether state run or not. And when you've worked the same amount of time, four years that you got free tuition for, then we'll give you an official transcript. Meanwhile, they can get an unofficial one that has also been translated from Farsi to um, uh, English by, minister, approved, by an approved Ministry of Justice translator. And we then began to hear, and it, it would be unofficial, I would say that on there, unofficial. What UT Austin decided to do was to go ahead and let that be sufficient for purposes of referral, uh, academic decision by the graduate program in question, uh, and then finally to enroll. But it's uh, we would hope that they would ultimately give us the original. All right. Um, if we would do this only if that unofficial document clearly stated that the individual had indeed passed all requirements for the degree and got the degree, right? And so then we would make allowances. More recently, we've heard some interesting things that the Iranian economy is so bad that, that uh, graduates are having a hard time finding jobs. And so um, they first give them the unofficial ones so they can get the job. And if they can't get a job within six months or so, then they'll go ahead and give, give in and give them an official one knowing that they just may not ever get a job uh, and thus uh, take care of their obligation. I've never seen that in writing. I have gotten um, uh, some confirmation on that from other sources, um, such as Nancy Katz, who's on the IESC, and of course, Jasmine Saidi Kuner, um, who's uh, an Iran expert. Um, but I also saw it in writing, literally yesterday, here at UT Austin, when 
um, we were given a document that, that, that uh, there was a cover letter from uh, the university with the unofficial transcript stating all of this, that the person had an obligation that they had to pay it off. Others? Yeah, that's in our experience too. Unfortunately, the final degree certificate is not issued um, to those who attend uh, public universities and have not completed their social and military service. So they, they'll get uh, likely get a provisional instead. Um, unfortunately for us, unless we receive the, the final official, we can't give the uh, degree equivalency or acknowledgement for that in our evaluation reports. And obviously we operate differently since we are an evaluation agency um, as opposed to um, a, a specific university. Alrighty, and we are running a bit short on time. Um, I see that the two remaining questions, uh, one is being answered by Dave, he's typing pretty quickly, but we do wanna be respectful of your guys' time. So thank you for coming. If you could, um, to the two that uh, posted those anonymous questions, if you could drop your emails or email us directly, we will get back to you. Um, and to Nee's question, um, we do have a network. I assume it's a network of um, professionals. So definitely join our international activities listserv. This is where professionals like yourself can all talk and ask questions and share new knowledge. We also um, have our QR code to start an EDGE subscription, as well as a QR code to subscribe to our Acro Connect newsletter. Again, as Drew said, these slides will be posted. And if you want to go to the last one, just really, really quickly, it's got all of the QR codes in one place. Orge? Should the last slide, Mike, real quick. Awesome, thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, it's got the majority of them and we'll, um, the International Pre-Conference um, Workshop, the International Institute is also available on our website. So thank you guys so, so much for joining us. Thank you for your questions and for your time and we will see you next month. All right, see y'all on the third Thursday of March. Great job, Christina, thanks. Oh. Uh -huh.